Hi guys, Josh here, and in 2023 we got a ton of farming games, maybe even a little bit too many farming games, it's been really hard to keep up even for me. So in this video, what I'll be doing is a tier list of all of the farming games that released and that I've played this year. I'll tell you what I liked and disliked about each one of them, and hopefully it should give you a good idea of what to play or avoid next. So as you can see, we have a pretty lengthy list. Some of these games are more traditional farming sims. Other ones are a little bit different, but they all have farming mechanics. And I hope I didn't forget anything. It took me a long time to like make sure I had all the games that I played this year. So if I forgot something, please let me know. But yeah, let's get started because we have a lot of games to go through. But first, let's talk about the different tiers. So first we have the S tier. So any game that I'm going to put in the S tier for me means I can play that game for hundreds of hours without any problem. Uh, it's a game that's mostly very addictive. Just a lot of fun and that I would recommend to anyone who loves a good farming game. Then we've got the A tier. So any game in the A tier is also going to be an excellent game. Maybe it has some flaws, but I would still play it for a whole playthrough and recommend most people to play it at least once and check it out. Uh, so yeah, these games are definitely worth playing as well. Then we've got the B tier. So games in the B tier are also good, but maybe they have some flaws or some features that will be maybe hit or miss with certain types of players. So they're not going to be as recommendable to everyone, but they're still pretty fun. Then we've got the C tier, and I like to say C for clunky, because I think a lot of the games that will end up in this tier will have great ideas, but not great execution. So maybe the controls are clunky or not responsive. Maybe there are some performance issues. And yeah, these are overall games that could have had potential but they, they just don't play that well. And then we've got the D tier, D for disappointing. So these are games that, once again, maybe they had good ideas, but just too many bugs or issues with the controls, and I would not recommend them. So yeah, let's get started. So I'm going to start with games that were in my tier list of 2022, as they released in early access last year, and this year they got their full release. So one of these games is My Time at Senrock. It was in the S tier last year, and it remains in the S tier today because it only got better uh, from the time it started Early Access to its full release in November. This game has so much content, just the main story itself will keep you busy from maybe 70 to 100 hours. There's also a lot of side content. Uh, the main focus of the game is crafting, but there's still a little bit of farming, and you also have the relationships, festivals, mining, fishing, and pretty much everything you would expect from a farming or a life sim game. A few points that I really like about this game is that most of the lines are voiced over. I would say this is probably one of the most beautiful games on this list as well. Well, that's if you play on PC, it's a really just a beautiful game, like the character models, the lighting, the animations, the environments. Also, speaking of environment, I really like that this game is an open world game, but the world is not too big. Whereas there are other games on this list that try to do open world and the world is just too big for no reason. But I feel like in my time at Senrak, it's just the right size and the world expands as you play. Yeah, it's just a very beautiful game, except if you get it on consoles, especially on the Switch. Uh, if I had to rate just a Switch version, this would probably be in the C tier because it doesn't run that great on the Switch. And I know they're still like working on it. But yeah, the Switch version doesn't look that great. Uh, but I'm basing this on the PC version because that's one I played the most, so that's going to go in S tier. The only thing I would say that could be kind of like a negative for this game is that the story, yes, it is long, but there are some parts that feel like a little bit stretched out unnecessarily, and I feel like they could have cut it a little bit shorter. But yeah, there's so much content in this game, and it is really a lot of fun. Also, it has a lot of quality of life improvements over the first game, My Time and Porsche. So if you're not sure which one to get, Go for a Sandrock, like everything is so much better in every way. The next game that came out in Early Access last year and that now got its full release is Coral Island. And I really, really wanted to give this game the S tier this year. But unfortunately, unfortunately, it will remain in the A tier. And that's pretty much for the same reasons it was in the A tier last year. So it's a really good farming sim. It does a lot of things right. It feels good to play. Uh, it has some few interesting new ideas as well, like diving underwater to clean the ocean. And it has one of the most diverse uh, cast of romanceable characters. Also, I like little details, like the characters changing outfits with the seasons and everything like that. Also, decorating your farm is very fun in this game. So 
I spent a lot of time on this game. I really love it. But for the same reasons I gave it an A while it was in early access is because there's still quite a few bugs and a few things remain incomplete. So for example, there is a quest line that you can start in the game right now, but you, that you cannot finish. There are some items in the shops, like there's one like music player, for example, just to give one example that you can see it, but you cannot purchase it because it's just not implemented in the game yet. There's also a merfolk kingdom in the game that you can go there, you can unlock the area, but there's really not much to do there. And a lot of these things will be added in updates in 2024. And I know these things were not supposed to be in the base game, but just because they're so interwoven with the base game right now, I feel like if someone was to buy this game right now and didn't look at the roadmap or anything like that, they will be quite confused because they will see, for example, a new biome that they can unlock and then they'll try to unlock it and they won't be able to go there. Then they'll go to the Merfolk Kingdom and they'll be wondering why they can't do anything there. And they will start a quest line that they can't finish and they'll be wondering why they can't finish it. So I feel like the way they implemented all of the future content into the base game makes things confusing. So for these reasons, I'm going to put it in the A tier. Um, I feel like next year it could probably go in the S tier. But yeah, so that is Coral Island. So these are the only two games that were on my tier list last year. But the next game I'd like to talk about also released last year for PC. But then it released this year for consoles and I forgot to put it on my list last year. So I'll talk about it now. Uh, I've only played the PC version, but this is Spirit of the Island. And I'm going to put it in this C tier. So in this game, you're on an island and pretty much you can decorate uh, most of the island and decorate your farm. And I feel like a lot of people are really creative with this game. So if you like decorating, that is a lot of fun. But... I feel like the game is a little bit clunky. Also, it doesn't look that great graphically, especially the characters. Uh, like when you make the characters to like the skin colors all a bit weird, you have like white and then you have like Simpsons yellow and then you have brown and then you have lots, lots of like vibrant colors. It's really hard to make like a good looking character in this game. And the NPCs are not that fun to interact with. Also, I know you can visit different islands and things like that. So I feel like this game has some good ideas. but. Just, it doesn't feel like a full release to me. It feels like some things are missing. And yeah, I was a little bit disappointed with this game. Maybe with some more patches and content, it could be better, but I'm not sure. So yeah, so that's Spirit of the Island. Okay, so now we're fully in 2023. All of these games released this year. And next I want to talk about Sprout Valley. And I'm going to put this one in the B tier. So Sprout Valley is a very simple kind of minimalist farming sim. You play as a little bunny on an island and you plant some crops, you do a bit of fishing, and then you can explore random little islands where you can pick up fruits. Sometimes there will be some kind of like mystery shops to buy some hats and little items to decorate your island. Overall, it is a very simple game. The only negative is that maybe there's not that much content. So I would say, I think this game is about like, between 10 to $20 usually, but sometimes it goes on sale for very cheap, like $5. So I would say if you can get it on sale, um, it's worth it. It's nice to play on the Switch when you want to play something just for a few minutes. Um, it's very, very simple. There's not like a ton of content, but it's cute. And I think it achieves what it tried to achieve, which is a very simple farming sim. Yeah, so that is Sprout Valley. And next, let's talk about Sugar Shack. So this one's a little bit different. It's not a proper farming sim, but it is a game in which you run a Sugar Shack. And if you're not Canadian, uh, maybe you don't know what it is, but it is a place where basically you eat a bunch of stuff with maple syrup. And yeah, so you run that shack and it's kind of like overcooked or lemon cake. So you have to cook and then you also have a little garden outside. So you do a little bit of gardening and there's a lot of like Quebec, like French Canadian folklore and stuff like that. So maybe I'm a little bit biased, but I really enjoy that. I think for this one, I'm going to put it in B. There are some bugs in this game. So I feel like that brings it down maybe from A. Uh, but it is a really cute game. It is a theme that we don't see a lot. It is a culture that we don't see a lot uh, in video games. So I feel like it deserves points for that. And I really like the gameplay loop of like running the sugar shack. I would recommend you check it out. And it is on Steam. I wish this was on the Switch as well, but it is on Steam. Next, I'm going to talk about a game 
that you probably never heard about. And unfortunately, the logo is not very visible right now. It's kind of the same color as my background. Sorry about that. But it's called Before the Green Moon. And this game is available on Steam. And it really caught my attention when I first started because it looks like a PlayStation 1 game. It really does look like a PlayStation 1 game, like the character models and everything. But in a good way, I, I feel like. So this game takes place in the future. I don't know if it's like a post-apocalyptic world. I'm not, I don't remember too well what happens. But I really love the atmosphere of this game. Not only because of the PlayStation 1 kind of look, but everything is very kind of like industrial. And I really like when it rains. The rain, just the mood is so nice. And like you, you walk in all puddles of water and there's like so much rain everywhere and you can hear the rain on the buildings. And yeah, I just really, really love the atmosphere. Unfortunately, the gameplay is very rudimentary. So you get some seeds for free uh, through the mail every day and you plant those seeds, but you can't really choose what you plant. Uh, there's no shops to buy more seeds. There's just like little vending machines where you can buy tools upgrades and stuff like that. Uh, I know you can adopt some chickens uh, with apples, and I'm not too sure how that works. I tried to adopt some chickens, and it didn't work for me. Uh, so the gameplay was a little bit confusing. The game doesn't tell you too much how to do things, and there's just not too much to do. So I just spent most of the days just walking around and looking at the city and the people. But yeah, I feel like I don't know what to do when I'm playing this game. So for these reasons, I put Before the Green Moon in the C tier. Next, let's talk about Sunhaven. So this game came out in early access, I believe, in 2021. And it got its full release this year. And this one was also very close to getting an S, but it is getting an A. This game has so much content. There is really a lot to do. And it's kind of like a double-edged sword for this game. I feel like sometimes it feels a little bit bloated. So, for example, there are three cities. So, like, in each city, there's different characters that you can romance. But you also have different crops that you can plant. So you have to manage three farms at once. Uh, you have different crafting tables, different resources. So it almost feels like each town is its own game. And I feel like when the game was in early access, it was not as bad because there were just a few different crafting stations. And they were all kind of like common between the different towns. But now there's just so many and a ton of different resources. And honestly, it can feel a little bit overwhelming. But other than that, though, it's a really fun game. There's a lot to do, a lot of content. Uh, there's a few festivals. Uh, I really love the mines as well in this game. I love the skill trees. So you have uh, lots of different abilities, and then you level up skills in different trees. And the progression, I feel like, is very fun. If you play with friends, it's also a ton of fun. Uh, you're also going to make a lot more progress quicker. It feels less overwhelming when you can play with friends and divide some of the tasks. But yeah, I played this game for over 100 hours, so like I'm really, really enjoying it. But you could cut a lot of stuff and make the game better by doing so, I feel like. So I feel like it's one of these games that actually regressed from early access to the full release. So maybe in early access, it would have gotten the S tier, but now because of the full release, that feels how it feels. I'm going to put it in the A tier. All right, next, let's talk about something a little bit different. Farming Simulator 23 Nintendo Switch Edition. So I know, even though it's called Farming Simulator, it's not like your typical farming sim, right? Because it's more industrial. You manage, like, you drive all of these tractors and you manage your fields and stuff like that. And Farming Simulator 23 is the one that came out uh, for the Nintendo Switch. And I believe mobile as well. I've played the Switch version. I even have a tips video if you want to get started in this game. And I think I'm going to put it in the B tier. The reason why I put it there is because I think it is a really fun game. It is relaxing. Uh, just driving your tractors. You can also kind of like automate. You can give tasks to different tractors, different trucks, and like tell them what, like you can hire people to drive them, right? I just find it very relaxing. And you don't have to like think too much when you play this game. But this one, the Switch version, it runs not too bad, but there's definitely not as much content as Farming Simulator 22, which you can get on Steam, and that's the full experience. Like, you have a lot more content in that one, whereas this one is more, well, it's the mobile version. So, like, it's a watered-down version of the game, so they removed a lot of content. Uh, like, the map is smaller. There's just not as many things you can do. So um, it's not the ultimate farming simulator experience, even if though the number is like higher, it's 23, but 22 actually has more content. So I feel like that can be a bit confusing. 
So if you want to get started with Farming Simulator, maybe check into 22 first if you want to play on PC. And then if you really want to play on the Switch, maybe 23. But yeah, so this one is in the B tier. All right, next, let's start filling up the D tier a little bit. Um, I'm going to put there Everdream Valley. So Everdream Valley is one of these games that I really, really tried to love. But unfortunately, I got disappointed. So I played the demo for this game a few years ago. And I remember one of the very first things uh, I did in the demo that I really, really enjoyed is that you have a dog and you can use the dog to herd the sheep, which was something I've never seen in a farming game. And also at night, you can take control of your animals like your dog to like uh, push away the wolves that are trying to eat your sheep. And I really like that idea. When I played the demo, there were lots of bugs, lots of like just issues and things that felt very rough for the game. And I feel like with the full version, those issues are still there. So it feels kind of like an early access game. It feels quite incomplete. And you'll see this is a pattern that we're seeing with a lot of farming games. We have so many games that feel very polished, fleshed out, uh, with so many features and like great animations, great graphics. So it's hard to like justify playing a game that doesn't feel very finished. It has some good ideas. And I played the new version maybe like 10 hours and I really tried to push myself to play it more. But I don't know, there's nothing that really keeps me coming back to this game for some reason. So yeah, Evergreen Valley has to get a D, unfortunately. Okay, next, let's talk about Ikone Island. So this one, I'm kind of torn between B and C, I think. I'm going to put it in B if you play with friends. So I feel like this game... Uh, one of the great features of this game is that if you have the game, your friends can join you and play for free, which I wish more games did. I think that's an amazing feature. But if you play by yourself, this game kind of feels a bit lonely. So if you don't know, you take control of these four characters. Uh, you're on an island that received the curse and pretty much it's raining all the time. So you have to fix these shrines so the rain goes away. And you also find these little animals that can help you um, like break some rocks or some trees and explore other areas of the island. And yeah, this game is mostly about gathering resources and crafting. And there is a little bit of farming, but the farming feels clunky. So you know what? Because of the clunky farming, maybe it's going to go in C for clunky. Now, if you play with friends, it's going to be fun. But if you play by yourself, you have these four characters and you just like switch between the characters one by one. And the other three characters are just there like standing and not doing anything. And it feels a little bit awkward. So I feel like it was really designed to play with friends. And if you play by yourself, it's it's a little bit disappointing. It's not a bad game, but as I said, we have so many great games. So it's hard to recommend uh, if you're playing by yourself. And while we're talking about islands, let's talk about Moonstone Island. So this one is going to get an A. I love this game. So if you like farming games and creature taming games like Pokemon and turn-based RPGs, and if you like Maybe a little bit of exploration in temples, kind of like in Zelda. I think you will love Moonstone Island. So basically in this game, you fly from one island to the other and you find these little creatures that you tame and you'll then use them uh, during battles. So the battles in this game are card based. It's a card based, turn based battle system. And I feel like it has just the right amount of strategy and difficulty. Uh, another farming game that had a card based battle system was Ooblets. But I found that in Ooblets, the battle system was a little bit too easy and there wasn't much strategy involved. But I feel like in Moonstone Island, it's a little bit more interesting. Uh, there's also a lot of decorating that you can do in this game. The only issue I have with Moonstone Island is I didn't get much feeling of community. So there are different characters, but I didn't really get attached to them. Uh, there's also like no festivals or anything like that as far as I know. And in my save file right now, there's a bug with Magic Man. There's like a guy with a moving house and I have a bug. This one is like completely glitched out. So I can't ever speak to him again, unfortunately, in my save file. So I can't really progress because it's kind of an important guy in the story to make progress. Um, so that's a little bit unfortunate. But if you don't have any bugs, uh, I think it's a really, really great game. So yeah, the farming is a little bit more minor in this game because uh, you can get sprinklers pretty easily so you don't have to like spend a lot of time farming but yeah it is fun all right so we're gonna go from moonstone island to harvest island this one is gonna go in the c tier and i don't know if you've ever played around with rpg maker or other kind of like game engines like that 
And Harvest Island really feels like it was made with RPG Maker and you can feel the restrictions of the engine. So for example, when you navigate the menu, it doesn't feel like it was designed for this game. And when you farm or when you want to milk a cow, every time you do an action, there's like a little menu that opens. So you go near the crop and then you open a little menu and then you press on water. And then, yeah, and then you're going to go to see your cows. And then to enter the pen with the cows, you have to interact to the fence and then click enter. And then you enter and then you click on the cow and then you click on milk. And there's like all of these little menus everywhere and it feels a very RPG Maker-esque. And maybe it's not RPG Maker, but it has to be one of these uh, similar game engines. Um, and unfortunately, that really removes a lot of points from the game because it just makes the gameplay not very nice. Not very smooth or enjoyable, but there are some good points to this game. That's why it's not going in the D tier. Uh, it has an interesting story. And keep in mind, it has some darker themes. Uh, so it's kind of like a horror kind of game almost. And yeah, so there's lots of dialogues in this game. You got to like reading. And it's the same like last year. I didn't like Wildflowers too much because it was mostly narrative driven. And this one is really narrative driven. And that's not the kind of game that's really for me or that I really like. And yeah, there's a lot of text, but I found the character is interesting, but I didn't like the gameplay, unfortunately. So it's kind of like before the green moon, right? I really enjoy maybe the atmosphere or something like that. But the gameplay, like a game has to have fun gameplay for me to enjoy it. So yeah, Harvest Island is in the C tier. And let's do the last island we have is the Witch of Fern Island. So this one, I'm going to put it in the B tier. And this one is in early access right now. It's a really beautiful game and you play as a witch. One thing I love about this game is that you can actually fly on a broom and it has lots of witch themed stuff in this game. So like you make potions and things like that. Um, but right now it is in early access and I feel like it's maybe a little bit too early to judge because a lot of the features are incomplete right now. And I would say my biggest complaint with this game that I wish they would fix is that the aiming for when you're farming or like trying to gather items like little mushrooms and stuff like that, it's really hard because there's no, like you can't really see where you're aiming. So you just have, there's no like crosshair or anything like that. So you just got to make sure that the middle of the screen is like where you're aiming and it just feels a bit clunky. But I feel like this game has a potential though. I feel like when it comes out of early access, uh, who knows, maybe next year, then maybe it could go in the A tier. Uh, I wish there was maybe character customization. Unfortunately, right now you have to play as Abriel, I think her name is. Um, so most of these games have character customization. Not all of them, but yeah, this one doesn't have any character customization. But you can customize your field and like your house and things like that. And this game is open world, so you're on an island, for an island. And there's a good amount of exploration, and I feel like it's fun to walk around or fly around. And... Yeah, Witch of Fern Island is getting a B. All right, so I think we did all of the island games. I don't know why <laughs> all of these farming games have island in their name. Actually, there's actually more games that happen on an island. But anyway, uh, I want to talk about something different for now. Let's go with Story of Seasons, A Wonderful Life. And I feel like if this game released this year as a brand new game, it would get maybe an A tier. But because it is a remake, I want to judge it based on the fact that it is a remake, if that makes sense. And I think I'm going to give it an S. So if you don't know, this is a remake of Harvest Moon, A Wonderful Life, which originally released for the GameCube. And it is a farming game where the focus is on uh, basically you just move to a little village and your goal is to get married and raise a family. And this game is divided into chapters. So every year, um, like a few years will pass and characters will get older. And especially at the beginning of the game, like some characters move in, maybe some other characters will pass away. And I love how the town is kind of like dynamic in that way. Um, unfortunately, this game can get a little bit long. It takes maybe like over 100 hours to finish it. And in the last few years, there's not like as many things to do. And I would say that's the weakest point with this game. There's not a ton of stuff to do. Like you're going to do farming fishing, there's a little dig site. So it could have been a little bit better, but what I really like about this game is all of the quality of life features that they added uh, compared to the original game. Like the farming is so much more efficient, like navigating the menus is so much better. Uh, also, I love the graphics of this game and I love uh, all of the little sound effects, like the atmosphere when you walk around and you hear the sound of the waves 
or like you'll if you go near the cafe you'll hear some music if you go near like the villa you'll hear some piano when lumina is practicing the piano and yeah the sound effects and just the whole atmosphere i also really like how the seasons change gradually so for example snow may start melting at the end of winter or in another year you could still have a little bit of snow at the beginning of spring so the seasons don't drastically change like on the first of each month so i really like uh it just feels very real and i love the characters in this game i love the story and yeah i just wish the gameplay had a little bit more stuff to do you know what i think i'm gonna put it <laughs> the more i talk about it like i really love this game i feel like i wish i could give it like an a plus can i do that oh, it's my tier list Let, let's put it between s and a and uh should i should i let's put it in a <laughs> No, you know what? Let's put it in S because I do like this game more than the other ones that are in the A tier right now. So yeah, it's going to go in the S tier. Okay, sorry for my undecision right here. It's hard to make these choices. Okay, next, let's go with Roots of Pacha. And this one is going to go in the S tier as well. I love this game so much. So this game is like a Stone Age twist to a farming sim. So it has all of the classic farming sim features that you would expect. But everything has a Stone Age twist to it. And the main thing is that at the beginning of the game, you don't know too much. Like, you don't have any tools. Uh, you don't know how to tame animals. But as you play, you will interact with members of your clan. And you will help them develop new ideas. So you will learn how to make some tools. You'll learn how to tame and ride animals. You'll learn uh, how to do irrigation so you can water crops automatically. And so you really feel a nice sense of progression. And this makes this game very addictive. It's hard to stop playing because you always like learn new things. I also really, really enjoyed the decorating in this game. So you have tons of like different furniture and stuff that you can place not only in your house, but also outside of your house in the village and on your field. So you have two big fields in this game that you can decorate. And there are lots of pots and frames as well that you can paint yourself. And I think that is the most fun. You actually get to pick the different colors and paint it. So one time I did a live stream with like other players. So we're like four of us and we're like painting pots together. And it was such a fun time. So if you can play with friends, yeah, this game has multiplayer. So it's such a fun time with friends. The only thing is that your friends will have to create a new character when they join you. So I would recommend like trying to progress together. Uh, whereas in Sunhaven, for example, Sunhaven, you can create your character on your own world, on your own save file, and then you can bring your character to a friend's save file. So, like, you carry your progression, right, from your single player to multiplayer. But in Roots of Pacha, each, like, the character is tied to the world. So, if you're not sure if you want to play a game in multiplayer, maybe Sunhaven or Roots of Pacha are two great options. But yeah, if you think you'll play together the whole time, maybe you can go for Roots of Pacha. But if you also want to play by yourself sometime, maybe Sunhaven would be a good pick. But yeah, so Roots of Pacha is really, really a lot of fun. And I honestly don't have too many negative things to say about this game. Uh, not too long ago, when I did my review of this game, one thing I said is that I didn't have any incentive to befriend the different characters. But they recently released an update where characters now give you gifts. So now you do have an incentive to befriend them. And honestly, this is a great game. It might, it might honestly be my favorite farming game of 2023. And I played this one for over 130 hours. Also, they recently released it for the Switch and it runs well on the Switch. So don't be afraid to pick it up on that console. And next, let's talk about Paleo Pines. So this one, I was honestly maybe a little bit disappointed. I think I'm going to put it in the B tier. So in this game, you're on an island and you have to befriend and take care of dinosaurs. I really like the wrenching mechanics in this game. I feel like in most farming games, taking care of animals is very simple. You just give them food, brush them, uh, take their products, and that's pretty much it. But in this one, it's a bit more involved because every dinosaur uh, has different needs. So some of them will want to be in a pen by themselves. Some of them will want to be in a herd. Some of them are carnivore or herbivore. And they also all like to eat different types of treats. So they're all different and you have to make sure that all of your dinosaurs are happy or they will leave. And if they are happy, they will help you with your chores. So some will help you till the soil, maybe water the crops or even expand your farm by breaking some rocks or some stumps. And yeah, so it's really nice the synergy that you have with your dinosaurs and how they help you on your farm. 
And I think the wrenching mechanics are great. And I would love to see more farming games in the future take inspiration from a few things that Paleo Pines did. Unfortunately, as much as I love the wrenching, there are a lot of things I didn't love about Paleo Pines. So, for example, this game is divided into multiple large areas, but navigating those areas is just not that fun. So, for example, if there's a little hill, you won't be able to walk that hill. If there's like a little river, like just a tiny bit of water, you won't be able to go there. And it feels very restrictive in how you traverse the world. Also, the characters are not that fun to interact with. Um, they don't have much like dialogues or anything like that. Uh, this, the game also doesn't tell you very clearly what to do or where to go. So it can be confusing uh, when you're trying to figure things out. Also, yeah, the controls, like when you're trying to farm or even decorate your farm, the controls are not the greatest. So yeah, it is a fun game. It is very charming and I really like it for the wrenching, but everything else felt a little bit lackluster for me. So yeah, so that's Paleo Pines. And this game actually brings me to Harvest Moon, The Winds of Anthos. And this game is gonna go in the B tier. Lots of Bs this year. And the first thing I will say about this game is it's a lot better than Harvest Moon One World and all of the other Harvest Moon games developed by Natsume. So in Harvest Moon, The Winds of Anthos, just like Paleo Pines, one issue I had was exploring the world. Uh, this game is open world and I would say it's maybe a little bit too big. A lot of areas are empty and you don't really feel the need to go there. Like once, you, once you've been somewhere once and you've unlocked it on the map, there's no really need to really go back there. So I feel like the world could have been made a lot smaller, kind of like in my time at Senrock, where as in Senrock, I feel like everything is important. Like the whole map is important and there's something to do everywhere. But yeah, in Winds of Antos, I feel like the map was a little bit too big. And it's also not that fun to explore because just like in Paleo Pines, if there's like a little cliff, you won't be able to go up. So sometimes you have to do a big detour and like walk around some, even though where you're going is like really close. But because there's like a little cliff or like a little bit of water, a little bit of something, you have to like walk for such a big distance. And yeah, I feel like an open world game should be fun to explore and walk around, but that's not the case uh, with the Winds of Antos. What I loved about the Winds of Antos is the graphics. Uh, it looks so much better than the previous Harvest Moon games. Uh, I think it's a good looking game. Also, there are lots of wild animals that you can tame in this game, like bears, tigers, rabbits. There's really a huge selection. And I love the animal models. So that's one good point for this game. But yeah, I don't know. Like the gameplay didn't keep me hooked. Uh, the story was kind of like really basic. And also the pacing of the game was all over the place. So the first few hours of the game or like not too bad and then got really slow and I didn't know what to do and then it picked back up again. And I feel like this game maybe gets kind of more interesting about 20 hours or so. But I don't know. I feel like it like the pacing is just all over the place. The game definitely has some good ideas and it's a big improvement over Harvest Moon One World. So I'm looking forward to seeing what Natsume will come up with next. Uh, I think they can do even better. So it's definitely a step up uh, for them. But still, it's really hard for me to recommend this game. I think if you liked One World, you will definitely love this one because uh, the gameplay is mostly similar to One World. So if you didn't like the gameplay in One World or the story, uh, you probably will not like The Winds of Anthos. Next, we have Dragon Noka. And you know what? This one, I'm going to put it with Harvest Island in the C tier. And for similar reasons, actually, I feel like this game was probably made with RPG Maker or like a very similar engine. So the controls are, I would say, maybe not as bad as Harvest Island. Like, you don't need to go through a menu for, like, every single action that you do. But the menus are still kind of clunky to navigate. And you can feel like, it feels like the menus were not designed for this game. And um, there is building in this game. But, yeah, like, the building is not that convenient or fun or easy to use. Uh, so that's the negative of this game. And the positive of this game is that you're on the back of a dragon and you kind of build a whole village. So you will have new people moving in and you'll build stuff for them. You'll build a house for them or a shop for them. So gradually as you play, your village will become livelier and livelier. And also your dragon moves around. So if your dragon, for example, flies somewhere and they get close to some water creature, like another water dragon, then maybe it's going to start raining on your dragon. Or if you go near an ice dragon, maybe it's there's going to be a snowstorm or something on your dragon. So I really like 
that mechanic because I've not seen that in any other game. And it actually reminds me a little bit of um, Rune Factory Oceans or Rune Factory Tides of Destiny, where you own Emir, that golem who like moves around the ocean. It's kind of similar because you can move around the dragon and you can also get into fights with other like giant, giant creatures. So I feel like it has some good ideas. Uh, maybe worth taking a look at. I, I feel like if you're not sure between Harvest Island or Dragonoka, I feel like Dragonoka is a little bit better than Harvest Island because the gameplay is more interesting. But just because of the engine that they're using, I feel like it's a little bit clunky. So, yeah. To be honest, I feel kind of bad right now because I feel like I've been bashing all of these games. I'm just trying to be honest and give you my, my thoughts. Uh, as much as I love farming games, there's just so many of them right now. And a lot of them are disappointing. A lot of them have clunky controls. And most of these games, like you can play for 50 hours at least. Because they all, like farming games are pretty long games. So I just don't want you guys to get stuck in a game that you don't like. And yeah, we don't have time to play all of these games for like 50 to 100 hours, right? So I'm just giving you my thoughts. But like, I'm not trying to be mean towards any of these developers. I know everybody worked really, really hard on these games. So I hope like if you're a developer watching and your game is in there, I hope you don't take it the wrong way. Um, like, I know there's been a lot of love into all of these games, but there's a lot of farming games. And for me, when I play a game, especially a farming game, polish and like responsive, smooth controls is like really important if I want the game to feel cozy and nice to play. Yeah. So that's it. So on that note, let's go to a game that I really, really loved. And this one is Cornucopia. So this game is a 2.5D farming sim and it is an early access. Uh, there are a few games in early access today on the list. But yeah, so Cornucopia is so much fun. Uh, it's very quirky, very charming. Like all of the dialogues, there's so much humor. And it's really fun to follow along the story. I also love the festivals. Uh, I did one or two festivals in this game. And there's lots of like little mini games and things like that. I really like how this game looks. I really like how it feels. It has a lot of personality. I feel like there's so much content and I never get bored with this game. And also there's so many updates, like the developer is mostly like a solo developer working on this game, but they're pushing out updates like almost every week or like every two weeks. Uh, so I need to get back to it because I know the game has been changing and evolving a lot. So maybe this game could even get an S tier sometime next year when it gets its full release. I would say one negative or maybe it's just a me problem, but when you plant, uh, when you do the farming in this game, you have to manage the nutrients that are in the soil. And every crop will require a different balance of nutrients. Crops will still grow even if you don't manage the nutrients. But I think maybe they, they will grow like a different pace. So you'll have like crops growing faster than other. And it seems like a bit of a headache <laughs> managing the different nutrients. Maybe I just need to learn it. It's kind of like uh, with the Rune Factory games where the farming can seem a bit overwhelming at first when you look with the magnifying glass and you see all the stats on your soil and you don't understand anything. Uh, so it's kind of the same feeling, but I feel like once I get over that hill and I learn how to do it, it's gonna be more fun. But it's a really, really fun game. It has a lot of personality, so I would recommend you check it out. Oh, the only other thing too is that uh, this game is not available in the UK right now on Steam, unfortunately. Uh, but anywhere else, you will be able to get it. Another game that is in early access is One Lonely Outpost. And this one, mm, I'm not sure. Our B is getting pretty full, right? You know what? Can I put Sugar Shack in A? I feel like I'm looking at all of these games and like I think I like Sugar Shack more than all of these other games. So I'm going to put one Lonely Outpost in B. And yeah, so this game, basically you're on an alien planet and you have to build an outpost. So you start uh, just by yourself and you have your, a little cat companion. And yeah, I love the interactions between your character and the little cat companion. I also love some of the mechanics in this game. So basically for your tools, you have kind of like a little laser gun. And to water your crops, you need to destroy little ice crystals and you get water from the ice crystals. So because you're on an alien planet, there's no like water well or like a river or anything like that. So I find it pretty creative the way that they did that. Also, there's a lot of exploration in this game. You have a like a little world map and you explore different areas. So I'm about five hours into this game right now. And the reason why I stopped playing is because it is very slow, which sometimes I love a slower paced game, but I'm not even sure like 
what I was trying to do in the game. I'm, I think I didn't have any goals. So I was just like wandering around and like skipping from one day to the next, not really knowing what to do with my time. So maybe it's a little bit a uh, lack of direction or maybe a lack of content. But I really like the atmosphere of this game. Uh, I really like the kind of space uh, alien planet theme and it's doing a fun thing with its mechanics. I love the little gun tool that you use. But yeah, I think, I don't know why I, I couldn't keep playing that game. So I wish I could tell you more about why, but I just kind of dropped it. So I'm really hoping to revisit it uh, whenever it gets its full release. Uh, I think it, it's going to be worth it. But right now it's a bit hard to recommend because yeah, I feel like I, I play it, but I don't know too much what to say about it because it, it didn't catch my attention too much, I guess. The next game is actually also in early access and it is Snacko. So I've been winning that game for years and years and it got shadow dropped earlier this month, like a total surprise. And I've been enjoying it a lot so far. In fact, I'm going to stream it right after I'm finished filming this video. It is so much fun. So I put it in the A tier. This game reminds me of Cornucopia because it has a very similar uh, art style. So it's 2.5D. Similarly to Cornucopia, it's also a game full of personality. So I love the dialogues. There's lots of puns, lots of cat puns, of course, because you play as a cat on an island. And they, yeah, all of the other characters are cats and other animals. And yeah, the dialogues are very fun. Even the item descriptions, like lots of puns, lots of humor in this game. Um, the graphics look great. I love the music. Uh, I love the animations, like when your cat is jumping and you also have like, you can have a little cart to drive around. It's so much fun. This game is just so pleasant to just like control your character and like play around and look at. It's just like a beautiful, pleasant game. So right now it is in early access, but most of the story content is there. They're just doing like polish and a few like fixing some bugs. Um, I would say the story is pretty short. I finished the main story in like 10 hours. So in my experience, there's kind of like two different storylines in this game. So there is one where you have to help the goddess and you're going to go in different areas and gather some materials and activate these big obelisks. And then there's the other storyline, which is restoring the town. So you'll have to invite new characters, kind of like in Animal Crossing. Uh, it was like, and then you place their house. Yeah, you're just going to revitalize the town and you also work on your farm at the same time. So I finished the story pretty quickly, like faster than I expected, but I still have to restore the town. But yeah, that's one thing I felt was a little bit disappointing is that I could finish pretty much the whole story with the goddess without restoring the town. So I wish the two stories were like a little bit more connected together. They felt a little bit disconnected. So now I'm feeling like it's almost not necessary to restore the town because I saved the goddess and everything. So uh, I'm not sure. I'm I'm thinking about putting it in the B tier now. Like I just love the atmosphere. And now I'm going to decorate my farm. But I'm not too sure what I'm going to do after that. So I feel like I'm going to play this for 20 hours. And then I won't go back to it after that, unfortunately. Yeah, right now I'm like 10 hours into this game. So I'm not too sure. I want to put it between A and B. I really, I think I'm going to put it in B for now. And if there is more content in the early access, more like side stuff to do besides the main story, then I'll go back to it and maybe get an A in the future. All right, we have five games left. Let's talk about Song of the Prairie. So this one... I like it more than all of the games that are in the C tier, but I don't like it as much as some of the other games that are in the B tier. So you know what? I think I'm going to move some things around. I think One Lonely Outpost is going to get a C and I think Song of the Prairie is going to get a B. So this game, what I like about it is that uh, I love the graphics. It's also a game that has a lot of personality, a lot of humor, but unfortunately the translation is quite bad. So the developers of this game are Chinese. So that's the, the first language that they're developing the game in. And all of the dialogues feel like they were translated with like Google Translate or like other automatic translation tool. So like you can get the main gist of everything and you can tell they put a lot of jokes and really try to make the game funny. Or maybe it's just funny because of all the translation errors. And maybe the developers are super serious. I'm not too sure. But yeah, it, it feels kind of rough and it's hard to recommend because of the translation is so rough. But it's also kind of what makes the charm of the game in a way. 
But the gameplay is quite generic. I feel like the gameplay works well. Everything that they did works well. So there's farming, um, mining, fishing. Everything is fine. But nothing is really unique. Nothing really stands out. There's nothing that I've not seen in the farming game before. And, oh, actually, this one is also in early access. We have quite a few games in early access. So, yeah, for now, I'm going to put it in B. And maybe in the future, maybe if they polish the text, the dialogues a little bit, and maybe it's going to get better. But for now, it's, it's just like a very generic farming game. It's not bad, but it's not great. It's very, like, everything is, like, in the middle, very middle. So I feel like the B tier is the best for that. All right, so we have four games left, and you guys can probably guess that these are going to fill our S and A tier. Uh, now, I have Wild Mender, and I wasn't sure if I was even going to put this game in this list, because it's really not like a farming sim, but there are some farming mechanics in this game, and I really love it, so I wanted to just talk about it. So Wild Mender is a game where you're in the desert and you have to greenify the desert. You start with a little oasis and then you're going to plant some grass, some herbs, some trees, and then you'll make that little oasis more powerful so it generates more water and then you'll be able to expand over and over and make a nicer, bigger oasis. And there are survival elements in this game, so you'll have to go in the desert to gather resources, and there is a little bit of fighting, and this game can be quite challenging with the fighting and the survival. So I would recommend playing with friends. It's a lot easier and a lot more fun with friends. But one great thing is that the game also has a lot of settings, so you can really customize your experience. For example, if you want to be thirsty less often, you can change that specific setting. So it has a lot of settings to customize your experience, which I think more survival games should have. Um, honestly, it's a lot of fun. And once you get going and like really start decorating your oasis, it's a lot of fun as well. So yeah, I'm going to give a wild mender an A. And honestly, I don't have much to say negative about this game. Uh, I think it's maybe not exceptional, like to get an S, but definitely an A. Yeah. All right. Next we have Rune Factory 3 Special. And this one I'm going to put in the S tier. And this is a remaster of Rune Factory 3. So it's not a remake. Um, it's the same as what they did with Rune Factory 4 Special. So they revamped the graphics a little bit. They redid some of the assets. They added a few things like a newlywed mode. But most of the features and everything are the same as in the original game. But yeah, I think it could have been nice to have a few options that we have in modern games. Like same-sex marriage or like being able to play as a girl. But yeah, this is a pretty old game um, at its core. So it has... Not as many quality of life features and just not as much content as the newer Rune Factory games. But it's a lot of fun and I like that the story is shorter as well. So you can finish this one between like 15 to 20 hours. So if you feel like playing a Rune Factory game but you don't want to play something for like 50 hours or like 100 hours, I think this could be a good one to start with. Uh, I actually do have a video comparing uh, Rune Factory 3, 4 and 5. So if you want to get started with that series, check that out. But yeah, it is a really fun game. Honestly, I love Rune Factory 3 Special. Next, we have Fae Farm. So Fae Farm is going to go in the A tier. I think we'll, we're going to have to resize some of these games. So with Fae Farm, I really love how the game feels. Uh, just like the farming and like using your tools and navigating the world, like jumping around, swimming. Everything just feels very polished and fun and smooth and responsive. And I just love the whole experience. The game is also very addictive. Every day that you play, you feel like you're making a lot of progress and there's always like something else to unlock, uh, something new to do. But the reason why it's not in the S tier is because the game feels a little bit shallow. Um, it feels like, yeah, there's just not too much depth to it. First, starting with the characters. Uh, characters don't have a lot of dialogues. Also, there's no like festivals except for like a little shop at the end of each month. But there's no real interaction with the community. You can get married, but it doesn't do anything. Also, for example, with the seasons. So every season, you'll be able to forage different items, get different fish, or grow different crops. But they all do the same thing. So for example, maybe one season, you'll get some blueberries. Another season, you'll get some raspberries. But they're both used in the same way, like you use them to make chopped berries and... Yeah, so it just feels kind of shallow because there's no difference between the seasons and between the different items. So I wish it had a little bit more depth. Um, so that kind of makes it hard to keep playing uh, for like a really long time or like to 
play it a second time. So like I would recommend doing one playthrough. But once you're done with the story, you can spend some time decorating your farm. But I feel like it, it's hard to like really go back to it. Because, yeah, it's a bit shallow. But I still really enjoyed it. Then we have Pelia. And Pelia, I'm going to put in the S tier. Now, I know this game is not for everybody. And it is different than a lot of games on this list. Because it is a free-to-play uh, MMO. It is an online game. Uh, so you can play it on PC. And it recently released on the Switch. I think if you can choose, I think the PC version is much better. It just looks so beautiful. It's also such a beautiful game on the switch it doesn't run as smoothly and it doesn't look as great but the great thing is it's free to play so you can download it on both platforms and there is cross play so you can start your account on pc and then you can continue making progress on your switch uh, when you're out of the house or something like that so i really like that with this game when it comes to the gameplay most of what you'll be doing in this game is that there are different skills so there's like farming foraging, fishing, bug catching. So you're going to do these different activities and you're going to collect materials and sell them to make money. And you can also decorate your farm. Everything feels very smooth and responsive, which once again is important for me. The only negative thing which kind of made me stop playing this game is that it can be quite grindy. So it takes a long time to level up your skills. Also, like at the beginning of the game, you're going to be crafting a lot of furniture very quickly. But once you get to the nice looking furniture near the end of the game, uh, it takes a long time to gather resources for so long just to craft one piece of furniture. So if you like decorating, it's a lot of work. And as you can see, I'm playing so many games every year. So I just don't have the time to commit to a game like this. It's kind of like Disney Dreamlight Valley. I didn't play too much because it was such a big time commitment. But if you're the kind of person that maybe doesn't play 25 different games in a year, then maybe uh, you can play Pelia. Uh, all year long and like make some nice progress and decorate your house nicely and yeah also there's so much stuff you can do with the decoration in this game and yeah it's really enjoyable but it's just the only thing is that it is kind of grindy and consuming a lot of time but that's the only thing but other than that i really like it and if you guys thought this list was finished it is not finished we have a little bonus game today harvest moon 64 which i know it released over 20 years ago but it recently re-released on the nintendo switch online expansion pack so if you have that membership uh, you can play it for included in your membership this is the first farming game that i've ever played so it means a lot to me and i just wanted to talk about it i've been making a lot of harvest moon 64 videos recently because i'm, I'm just obsessed <laughs> With this game, like, it literally changed my life. Uh, I just love it so much. So I'm going to put it in the S tier. Uh, keep in mind, it is an old game. So, for example, every time you want to take something out of your bag, you have to press uh, start and, like, take like to change your tools as well as the same thing. So you have to press start every time. And there are also lots of bugs in this game. But it is very charming. And I love how each season is different. I love how like in winter you can't plant any crops. Uh, so you have to like either build a greenhouse or you can go to the mines, which are only accessible in winter. Also, your animals can die easily in this game. For example, if you leave them outside and there's a typhoon, they're going to die. Also, time goes by very quickly in this game. So you have to like manage your time. So it's a kind of like hardcore <laughs> challenging farming game. I still think for me, it is very relaxing and very chill. But I feel like recently a lot of farming games are just too easy and don't have a lot of challenge. But yeah, Harvest Moon 64 is quite challenging, especially if you're trying to do like a perfect run and complete the photo album. And I would love to see more games taking inspiration from like this one specifically. I would say the graphics also age pretty well for a Nintendo 64 game. The music is amazing. The fall theme is one of the best video game music of all time, in my opinion. And yeah, the villagers are charming as well. I just love the atmosphere of this game. So yeah, if you've never played Harvest Moon 64, you definitely should check it out. And let me know what you guys think of my tier list. It was really, really hard to select a tier for some of these games. And yeah, we had so many great farming games this year. I really hope this video was helpful and that you were able to maybe um, decide what you're going to play next or maybe eliminate uh, some games from your wish list. 2023 was a great year for farming sims and 2024 will be even better. So if you want to keep up with everything farming sims related, make sure you subscribe. I'm trying to get to 50,000 subscribers by the end of the year. So 
please join us in the gaming garden and leave a like if you enjoyed this video and i'll see you all next time